for about a month, it got harder and harder to sleep because I knew that crazy mud-headed bastard was stalking me, him and his damn jackals. But he didn't know that I could turn into a shadow. So I started stalking him just to figure out how he operated and get his weaknesses so I could form an attack plan if it came to that. A couple of times on night patrol, I, I stepped on a branch, snapping it, and all those jackals stood stone still. Their eyes and ears probing the darkness trying to find me I was an idiot. For all I knew, those jackals might have been able to see through my shadow, but I was more worried about them smelling me. Then I'd get scared and not quiver a finger for a thousand breaths if that's what it took for them to finally march on out. Or on the times I didn't blow my own cover, sometimes I just got bored, so then I'd leave, dig up some grubs, and bring them back to my falcon to feed them breakfast. Or I'd check on my rat traps for my day. But I knew eventually that old mudhead and I were going to have a showdown. I hated him. Guy wouldn't leave me alone. Thought he owned the, owned the whole Savage Lands. My only chance was to lure him up a tree where his jackals couldn't go. And then I'd gut him or slit his throat like a goat's. I fell asleep dreaming that my mother had never died, but was just pretending so that the destroyer couldn't find her and that she was still looking for me. Hey, asshole! It was him. So much for my plan. The night, full moon, and I was stuck out in the open, no shadow, lost in my head, refighting all my old battles, re-losing all the kids, re-watching my friend die and the kids get shredded by crocodiles all the while. My hands did the work of strapping my fang to a, a long, broken branch for use as a spear. I'd done such a good job strapping fang on, I couldn't rip it off, so now it was useless against those jackals in close-up defense. And they had me surrounded them and all their teeth. So we charged each other. Stop it! We both stopped totally. The jackals, too. There was a man standing there in silhouette. The moon was right behind his head like it was balanced there. Beside him was a tall bird up to his hip with a curved beak. I didn't know what those birds were called, but I'd seen plenty of them. But this one was different. It was black gold-rimmed eyes. I tried moving, but it was like I was made out of rock. My enemy's eyes were whirling, but his mouth was grimaced like he was straining to use it and couldn't. The jackals just stood like stumps, whining and panting through their noses. You're defiling this land, taking each other here, said the moon-blackened man. You think this is what the gods want? What the gods won't punish? Great. One of those religious weirdos. <laughs> God's this and punish that. At least in my mom's camp, I didn't have to listen to that crap. She used to laugh at people like that. <laughs> what good are the gods, she'd say. Don't be thanking them. I'm the one who got you this food. But this crazy old man with this big black bird out here in the Savage Lands at night, his own words of power, stilling us like stone. That was a bad combination probably some warlock who got chased out of his village for too much dancing or babbling full blast in the middle of the night or turning people into goats. You know, warlocks do that, you know, just for kicks. Follow me, you two. And your puppies, too. <laughs> I loved that. <laughs> Even though I couldn't move my mouth, I could just imagine Mudhead choking on puppies. <laughs> we marched stiffly. I still couldn't budge my raised spear arm and it was throbbing. Finally, the old man noticed and told me to put it down and my arm went down on its own and we went up the hill in darkness. At the top, he ordered us to sit. All of us except the black bird did, even the dogs. Behold, he whispered, maybe to himself. He lifted his arms to the horizon, the moon still perched above his head, and the sun came up, just like that, blinding gold. I shielded my eyes. It took me a minute to realize that I could move my arms again. My enemy was figuring out the same thing. 
he flinched. I leapt up with my spear and stopped because we were surrounded by about 40 goddamn baboons with gougers bigger than the jackals had. It was the old man's gang. My enemy and I got the message, and we both sat back down. <laughs> That's better. Now be quiet and listen, and hopefully you'll learn something. He waved his hand in front of the baboons, and they all started singing. And I've seen crazy things. Devils boiling out of a sinkhole and dragging a man to his screaming death. Cows with eyes so beautiful they nearly made me cry. Veils of stars transforming into my mother's face in the night sky. But baboons singing? That was new. <laughs> and their song was beautiful. Like gongs and chimes and the sound of the river eternal where I come from back in the black land. We listened silently while the sun rose. Even the jackals were still. When the baboons stopped, the old man came over and crouched on his haunches. Now, you two listen to me. I've been watching you both for quite some time. You're both resourceful. You've survived the death traps out here all on your own. You were each smart enough not to drink the swamp water and your excellent rangers. But for smart kids, you're both pretty stupid. I've seen you both spoiling for a showdown. More times than you can dream, I let one or both of you, of course, at the last moment. He snorted and spat and then went on. But I can't be everywhere in the savage lands. And I won't always be able to stop you two little brutes from ripping each other into bloody bits. You'll both die, you know it, and I know it. And then he pointed to the horizon and he whispered, white mountains appeared there, tall enough to scrape the sky's skin with sides as straight as sun rays. The savage lands were gone. No horror jungles filled with bandits, slavers, soldiers, and murderers. No swamps of death clogged with crocodiles and clotted over with scum. No children marching or farming in chains. And no burnt-eyed kids gripping hatchets or drowning each other or beating each other to death. Instead, I, we, because I saw my enemy seeing what I saw, and his face looked warped and bizarre to me. And then I realized what it was that he was happy. And I hadn't seen a happy face in longer than I could remember. We looked out onto the purified blackland of lotus flowers and straight paths banked by trees all exactly the same height and saw people by the millions baking bread, carving statues, reciting poems, painting walls, setting broken bones, cuddling babies sailing boats, sewing clothes, lifting stone, and sleeping soundly without fear. If you two can forget about your little war, when out in the savage lands it's nothing but war, said the old man who turned the horizon into the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I'll teach you both what I know, so you can make our brutal world die, and bring that one to life. We looked at each other, my enemy and me, and for the first time we did it without glaring, just looking. We nodded at the same time. Good. Then come back with me to my house. I've got food and clean water that won't poison you. Sir, said my enemy. I glanced at him. I'm so polite also. <laughs> like, maybe underneath all that mud, he wasn't a born savage. Um, I work for this sorceress, and um, I don't think, you know, that I should just quit like that, because she wouldn't <laughs> trust me to be fine. <laughs> Uncle, I said, because back in my day, that's how you showed respect to an old man if you didn't know what his title was, and warlock didn't sound appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have this animal that I take care of, uh, a falcon. I need to get him. You mean this one, said the old man, right there on his shoulder. I don't know how I missed it, but there was falcon. Perched there as happy as could be. The old man gave him a nut, which he crunched and swallowed. Hoo, hoo, said the falcon. Um, all right then, 
I said, impressed? I, I didn't know Falcon knew how to fly. How did this old man know? We moved out. His place wasn't much. It was a hut, but it was dry. He wasn't lying about the food and water. He had plenty of each, and even enough for the jackals and Falcon, his own big black bird, and the occasional baboon who came around. I finally realized the baboons were just like the bird, black with gold eyes. The Savage Lands was like that. Everything was weird. The master, that's what we ended up calling him, taught us a bunch of stuff neither of us knew anything about. Like how to make bread and how to make bricks. When he tried my first bread, he said, we'll use this for the bricks. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed, and I, you know, I must have looked hurt because he said, oh, I was just kidding. I wonder, I wonder why he's got that big old bird with him all the time. I said to Yenapu, my old enemy, one day when we were drying bricks, the one with the curved beak? It's called an ibis, stupid. He's shaking his head and laying a line of bricks. Don't you know anything? Now, maybe we weren't enemies anymore, but he was still a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> we were building a wall. It was supposed to surround the master's hut and storage areas. And while we built us, he taught us about numbers and measurement. What's all this for? You've seen all of us, those lost children out there? Yeah, I mean, yes, master. <laughs> You've seen how they're being treated. I felt my heart pounding. My neck went hot. I felt the cold anger of my blade fang in my hand, even though I'd left it back in the hut. I heard Falcon make the cry he makes when we go hunting. I almost said the words, are we gonna rescue them? Yenipu looked at me like he was thinking the same thing. And the master said, the ancestors scatter their wisdom like a sower his seed. And those who would feast must first sweat beneath the sun. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> By his face, neither did Yenipu. It definitely wasn't what I wanted to hear, which was a battle plan, so we went back to laying bricks. So we didn't mount any rescue missions. No storming the mines or the farms, me with Fang and Falcon, Yenipu with his gang of jackals, and the master with his army of ripped teeth baboons, gutting the chainsmen and taking their ears for our necklaces. But when we were foraging for supplies or checking our traps, sometimes we'd find Straggler kids who'd run away or gotten lost. They were always sick and hungry. They looked like hell. We try to convince them to come with us. But you can't always talk sense to people, and some of them were still crazy from drinking swamp water. The master took in whoever we brought back, and I was glad we'd done all that work on the wall. We had a defensible area with enough space for sleeping, and on papyrus reed mats, we didn't have to sleep in piles like dogs. We had food trees inside the wall, and the master ground up seeds and boiled leaves and bark and made all kinds of medicine to make these kids we found right again. A lot can change in three years. I got strong, I became a good fighter, and so did Yenipu. We'd stop being idiots for the most part anyway. Really, him and me, we, we were good partners. We talked about it. We never talked about it or anything, but we worked well together. We laughed a lot about whatever. I knew my mom was dead. If she weren't, she would have found me. She had her own words of power, plenty of them, and she loved me. She never abandoned me, so she had to be dead. And like I said, Yin, he never talked about his folks. But some of the kids we brought in, they stayed savage. You, you could take their heads out of the lead mines, but you couldn't take the lead out of their heads. <laughs> One day I saw Yin whistle to his jackals and take off like he was really angry. I grabbed one of the older kids. Yin and I were the oldest. It was a girl named Neff. What's wrong with him? What happened? I don't know, she said. Don't tell me. I don't know. I saw you over there with him. What happened? Ah, oh, he's just mad again. He's always mad. That's not true. He's great with you kids. The good kids, anyway. You say something to him? No, it wasn't me. It was the other kids bopping them. Stop making me drag this out of you. What happened? Well, yeah, he was saying something about his witch, and well, none of us had ever seen her, and all oh, this again. I, I, you know, I had tried gently to tell Yin to shut up about his sorceress, but I didn't want to hurt his feelings, so great, great work, Neff. It wasn't me, Rue, it was Bob. Did you, did you tell him to stop? 
God, Yin's your older brother. You kids are supposed to treat him with respect, and after everything he does for you? She started crying. Well, maybe you should cry, I said, but I didn't mean it. I probably should have apologized or given her a hug, but instead I wanted to yell at Bach and his little pack of creeps. Yin was going to be gone for a while. He was sometimes gone for a couple of days at a time, but the master always said it was fine, that he had work to do and lessons to learn, but this time it felt different. It felt wrong. That night after I put the little kids to sleep, I sat up with the master and two of his baboons and his black bird were watching the campfire. Inside the walls, the light didn't carry, so we didn't have to worry about bandits or raiders. And devils only came for bonfires, not campfires. After he and his animals finished a quiet song, I asked him, Master, what, why are you bothering with all these kids anyway? I was still mad about Neff and Bach, and I told him, I told him all about it over dinner. He looked sad. Well, look, they're just kids. You and your partner were both pretty rough when you came here. I know you remember that. Yeah, I mean, yes, master. And we've both seen a lot worse than that behavior. He stared into his hands like there were secrets in them. But as for me, I was just like any of these kids when I was small lost out there, alone, no parents, hunted, and then my master found me. And he was the same, you understand? And that's the chain of us, the golden chain, going all the way back to when the first mountain pushed its way out of the ocean. He told me about the first times already, so he didn't need to explain. When our ancestors want to know something, they want us to know something, they send somebody to teach us. My masters are me now, and I am them. I tried to absorb all that. I figured it would take me a while, so I just said, I, I will understand, Master. He smiled. Gold was in his eyes. All the kids by then were asleep, not just the little ones, so I felt safe asking them something else. Master, why did the destroyer attack us in my camp when I was little? Why did he kill my mother and your father? I was shocked. Never heard that before. The destroyer killed my dad, too? Yes, son, I'm sorry. I didn't ask him how he knew things. He knew things. Why is he doing all of this, enslaving these kids by the thousands, fighting this endless war, butchering people, and making us so afraid of everything and everybody that we all hate each other? And again, he was silent for a long time. He said eventually, the truth is like the sun, with the same rays, a bringer of light, and yet a champion of death. Sustainer and annihilator, it grows the one plant full and sweet, while it shrivels the other one into crackers. I shook my head without intending to. Sometimes I loved the way the master said things in such a pretty way, with words as beautiful as a frog's eye or a snake's scales in the sunlight. Sometimes what he said was so perfect I just had to memorize it. But other times I just wanted him to give me a straight answer because it made my head creak and crack just hearing him. He must have seen how upset I was because he said, Oh, you're not ready yet. If I told you now. Good night, Master, I said. <laughs> Finally, he said good night to me, too. I marched off to my mat and lied awake for a long time, looking at three bright stars in a row, wondering about my slaughtered parents, wondering about my friend out there in the savage lands alone, wondering about the destroyer whose empire was out there in everything, in everybody.